Welcome and thank you everyone for attending today's HIMSS Industry Solutions webinar, Cloud Powering the Connected Health Continuum. It is sponsored by Philips. Our presenter today is Yurun Tas, CEO of Healthcare Informatics Solutions and Services with Philips. Before we start, I have some housekeeping notes. Our agenda today is to cover trends and developments in health tech. It's about transforming models of care, new opportunities for precision diagnostics and personalized care, new opportunities for personal and population health, integration of data across the health continuum, unleashing the power of cloud, and we'll follow up with key takeaways. The learning objectives for today are to hear about the latest developments on integrated healthcare delivery, to learn why an open, scalable, built-for-purpose cloud platform is an imperative for truly connected healthcare to be realized, to gain insight through examples of what is already possible in connected healthcare and what is lurking on the close horizon, and finally, to better understand why seamless interoperability between health cloud platforms is the ultimate key to success. With that, I'd like to turn over the presentation to Yarun Tas. Thanks so much. Um, I would uh, like to wish everybody a warm welcome to our, our webinar. Um, so you heard the agenda. I, I want to actually start up with giving you a little bit of background uh, about Philips. Uh, Philips is actually 126 years old. And when the two brothers, Anton uh, and, and his brother, started, uh, started Philips, they were seeing that um, the electricity grid brought new opportunities and they said, well, there's gonna, uh, light is going to change the world. It's going to change the way we work and, um, and live. And then a couple of years later, uh, with the invention of the X-ray, they, they told a similar thing. Hey, we see this, this runch in technology in Germany. Um, the X-ray machine will have a huge impact on health. And actually, interestingly, the technology was quite similar because it was all based on tubes. Then fast forward a couple of years, um, radio was going to make a big impact on the world, uh, a new technology. And Philips uh, became very active in, in that uh, technology because, again, the brothers thought that that technology would have a huge impact on the way we communicate. And, so on with television and uh, many of the other inventions that have come uh, from Philips. But I think now we're in the middle of another big uh, te technological uh, transformation that has huge impact on uh, the way we provide care and the way we support health. And I think that's, um, that's basically the mission of Philips um, and 100 years as we first started getting involved in healthcare, we're now truly becoming a, a health company. We're becoming a health company that's not just looking at um, helping people when they're ill and, and when they suffer from conditions or disease and use our patient monitors to monitor them at home or in the hospital or in the ICU. Um, we're not just using our diagnostic systems to um, you know, to take um, an image of their uh, uh, physiological or their uh, autonomy. Uh, we're actually now looking at how we can truly help people live healthy. And if they have a condition, how can we help them um, deal with that condition? So we want to base that on what we know and what we've learned. And it's interesting if you look at the numbers because that's also an indication of the kind of data that's being generated every day. Um, so as I said, we have um, uh, a strong position in patient monitoring. Actually, 40% of all patient monitors around the world um, are monitoring 270 million patients every year. Um, 135 billion images are coming out of our MRIs, CT scanners, ultrasound machines, etc. But already we have over 8 million um, devices connected to our cloud. We have 7 million people that are connected um, to our personal emergency response or our connected ventilators. And we have about 900 million radiology studies that we can look at in terms of understanding um, 
what we can learn from those Im images and the radiologist's observations. So we see a tremendous opportunity to support the care of people through technology, through data, and actually bringing together the world of devices, bring together the world of software and the world of data, and enable the healthcare system to provide better care, to give more control to the patients, to bring together the data from different sources and allow clinicians to be better at supporting this. So with that, we want to give you the following question. Which of the following you see as most impactful to achieve truly meaningful outcomes from this new health IT ecosystem in support of value-based care, in support of care that really looks at better outcomes for populations? So I'd like you to look at this, give you a little bit more time because I think it's really interesting to see um, how you're thinking about the impact of, of information technology on care. Okay, well let's, uh, let's look at the results. Very interesting, almost half of you believes that access to deeper, denser, and wider patient data for clinical, clinical decision-making and treatment planning is going to be most impactful for better outcomes in care. Then the next one, um, clearly second, is patient engagement, empowerment, coaching, and related personalization programs. And then accountable care analytics, and, and lastly, telehealth. And, um, I think it's a good reflection also as to where we see um, the opportunity and the biggest impact. You know, I, I think bringing data together and making it available to both patients, care team, and clinicians will be critical. Um, but ultimately also that the real engagement from the patient, um, that supporting and coaching those patients and empowering those patients to make sure it has a real impact on their health behaviors will be um, almost as important. So I'm, I'm really happy to see um, this feedback because I think it's aligned with, uh, uh, with where you see also the, the emphasis we get from many of our uh, 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 health systems. So let's get to, uh, to the next section of our, uh, our story here. Um, so what we see is, and, and I think this is familiar terrain for many of you, the Clearly, uh, we have some major challenges. It's not just that the population is growing, but also the population is aging. And chronic disease is, um, is having a major impact on not just the cost of care, but also the condition of um, population. So just to give you some, some numbers, to give you a sense of, of what we're talking about, um, half a billion people are suffering from diabetes or uh, are at high risk of diabetes. Half a billion people have pulmonary disease, COPD, asthma. Over a billion people have hypertension. Over a billion people have neurological disorders. 30% um, of all the people on this call and in general will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. So, and cancer is increasingly becoming a, a chronic disease because prostate cancer, breast cancer, most cases are actually people living with it and controlling their condition. So in the U.S. alone, 87% of all the spend is on chronic disease. And, um, you know, uh, the, the spend in, in, in the U.S. is well over $3.2 trillion on health care. That's, uh, that's almost four times the, the total GDP of the Netherlands, the country I'm uh, I'm resident. So, um, so it, it, we're talking about a substantial slice of the GDP. We're, we're talking about uh, a pattern of disease that's, that's chronic, that where somebody who suffers from chronic disease will continue to probably suffer from that the rest of their life. So, so it has an impact if we adjust or adapt the way we provide care to the patterns and the needs of the, the patients. We'll see a different kind of system. Um, 
at the same time, we see a shortage of healthcare professionals. And, and also we see um, a, a shortage in certain areas of, of specialization. Geriatrics is, is an example. You know, as the graying population grows, we'll have a huge mismatch between doctors that are specialized dealing with elderly people and the number of elderly people. You know, we're looking at pathology and there are tens of thousands shortage of pathologists around the globe. Um, in one country, there are, you know, a, a very high number of cardiologists. Um, for instance, in Indonesia, there are barely a thousand cardiologists on a population of 250 million. So not only do we see a shortage, we also see a mismatch. So the, these are big challenges. Now, many of the current approach to healthcare are, are clearly not efficient uh, because they're still based on an acute care system. So they're still based, you have a problem, you go to your general practitioner. It's a really bad problem, you go to your uh, uh, specialist or hospital and you get, get treated. You know, you typically get treated when you show the first signs of COPD. You don't get treated if you're still smoking. So prevention is going to play, of course, a much bigger role. And, uh, and of course, ultimately, we want to pay for outcomes. We want to pay for results. And today, we're paying for inputs for procedures, so a fee-based system. Now, we see technology playing a big role, but technology can never solve all our problems. Technology can enable solutions, and technology can help us. And technology can clearly show us different ways to work together. So that will be the theme of, uh, of this discussion. So if we look at um, what we're seeing, so what, what's behind it. So as I said, this, uh, this huge pressure on the system because of chronic disease really forces us to think from you know, purely episodic care you know, when things are really bad, to continuous care and early intervention. Prevention and early intervention are critical to, you know, uh, solve issues at the early stage. You know, if, if you diagnose somebody with cancer at stage one, you still have a great opportunity to control it. And uh, if you have to start treating somebody when the cancer is at stage three, the cost will be way higher over the life of the patient. Um, stage four, unfortunately, is, is lower cost because at that time you, you're in a terminal state. Um, so from episodic to continuous, that means orchestrating care 24-7 with focus on the chronically ill. Today the system is largely physician-centric. You know, that's understandable. That's the way you know, things have been for the last 50, 60 years. You know, you go to your doctor. You get sent to the hospital. But in the new world, it will be patient-centric. It will be around the patient experience. It will be around the needs, addressing the true needs of those patients across the continuum, from prevention to diagnosis, treatment, and uh, to supporting people from home. And we've seen that in other industries as well. Um, and, and many of the new digital models have recognized that. You know, um, clearly Uber has had, had recognized that the transportation experience is not a, a great one. You know, trying to explain to a taxi driver where you want to go, you know, having no cash or uh, not accepting credit cards, don't know exactly whether you're going the right route. Um, that was one problem Uber wanted to solve. Then at the other end, Uber wanted to solve a supply and demand problem. So there are many people that want to offer their services, many people that demand it. So they took away some of the constraints in the system. And I think we're going to see similar approaches to providing care. And then, of course, we're not talking about car drivers here, but we're talking about nurses, physicians, specialists that will optimize their knowledge and expertise and make it available where it's most needed. So, you know, bringing together the, the supply and demand for these highly specialized skills and capabilities in a much more scalable way. So we'll move from fragmented care 
to connected care. Today it's fragmented. Um, you know, I'm I'm watching this very closely as my my daughter has type one diabetes. She's dealing with ten different clinical um, uh, disciplines. Um, many of these people have never talked to each other because they're in different organizations. Um, nobody has the full picture. My daughter is creating her full picture. So what we need to do is we need to start connecting patients and teams of caregivers. So it's not going to be 10 different doctors and nurses. It's going to be a team of specialists that can support a group of patients. And they will do that through data, a full picture of the patient, but also workflow and pathways that are tuned to the needs of that patient. And then lastly, um, the reimbursement system will start supporting this. The, the reimbursement system will move from what's essentially paying for procedures fee for, uh, for service, volume-based, to truly value-based, and value representing the best outcomes, improving the health of populations. Now, against that backdrop, um, we have started looking differently at our business. We have started looking differently at the way we interact with our customers, the health uh, providers and the health payers. Um, and we started looking at it from the lens of the patient, uh, from the lens of the patient who has a journey. And, and we all have a health journey. You know, we have a history. We have a medical history. We have a, a contextual history. Uh, we are in a certain state now. You know, I can check my, my heartbeat uh, on my watch and uh, get a sense of how I, um, how how my vital signs are right now. But I'm also on a journey. You know, I have certain personal risks. Uh, you know, in my case, hypertension that I need to control. Um, you know, there are issues in my family that that point to me as being at risk in certain areas that I need to manage. And I know that certain of my health behaviors uh, will impact my health, and I need to make the trade-offs on uh, on these decisions. If something happens to me, I want the caregiver to know everything about that history, the current state, and also um, how we're going to jointly resolve my diagnosis and treatment plan. So we want the continuum to work. So working across the full spectrum, and that means across settings, because even when we're very ill, we're not just in the hospital. And increasingly through um, non-invasive procedures, you know, you have to open up a valve, insert a stent, or apply uh, chemotherapy. Uh, we do that through image-guided therapies, and we'll have you out of the hospital the same day. But you still need to be monitored. So we want to make sure that the settings, wherever we go, we bring along that data and that context, and um, that when you get out of the hospital, that's not a huge leap. That's actually a small step, and we'll continue to monitor you across people. So not just you as a patient, but your your family, patients like you, like you, the but your general. Pr uh, practitioner, maybe your diabetes nurse, maybe a nutritionist, uh, a physiotherapist, an internist, a cardiologist. So how can we make sure that we provide that continuity um, across the care team, but also across the state of your disease? So if you move from prevention to actually acquiring a chronic disease, then how can we make sure we carry that along? Across data, so not just you know, EMR data, images, but also data from wearable, data from apps, data from sensors, observations that you make yourself about your health, that all become part of that full health profile that you create. And then, of course, across time, because, you know, everything changes over time. As you get older, you get more constraints. As you get older, the probability of chronic disease dramatically improves and uh, of increases, and we need to make sure that we provide that support across time as well. So what's the role of data here? Um, and, and I think we, most people on this, on this webinar 
um, are probably here because we see the big opportunity, the big opportunity of big data. Um, you know, we can see that by collecting that data, normalizing it so we can all interpret it the same way, make it interoperable, by aggregating and analyzing that data, we're going to help people in their daily life. We're going to help people nudge them towards the right health behaviors. Um, we're going to give the care teams the right alerts to intervene when they see deterioration or when an acute situation happens. But we're also going to create much more profound understanding um, of the physio physiological state of a person so that we can apply the right um, precision in the medication and therapy. So we're talking here at Philips about what we call white data or longitudinal data. There's a lot of data that you collect throughout the day, you know, from wearables. You get up in the morning and maybe your um, your lifeline pendant, which is uh, you know basically a dedicated phone that we give to elderly people, and she you see in the picture on the uh, top left uh, an elderly person wearing this pendant with a big button, but it also collects data about her health. It tells us, you know, how she moves, where she moves. It tells us that we see a deterioration because she's getting up more slowly. Or if this person suffers from Alzheimer's and she wanders more than 50 meters from her home, it gives us an alert so we need to intervene to bring her back to an environment that she feels comfortable. Um, you see at the bottom our health watch, which is a validated device that tracks heart rhythm, heartbeat, um, exercise, um, etc. So it gives us the tools to track ourselves, but over time in context. Now if you move to the deep data, we're really looking at not just through what we do on images, so we're applying deep learning and, and image interpretation which allows us to create these from an MR or CT image, a, a full 3D model, and we can actually identify within, in this case, the liver um, where the lesion sits. So if we we want to uh, analyze the cancer, we can basically through the image see the volume, where it's located, and then we can actually apply an algorithm that even looks at whether the cells in that uh, the lesion are alive or dead. And actually in this case we can see that the lesion is, is large, but only a small part has still live cells. Now, if we're interested in those cells, we can capture tissue through, again, through an image-guided uh, procedure. We can pick up that, that tissue and we can stick it into our digital pathology device, which will then give us back the information on the cell structure of the cancer and the area around the cancer. Now we can look at it on a molecular level, molecular level. We can even look into the cells, into the protein, and based on that structure, we can then decide which cells we want to do a DNA analysis on, because that will then help us really understand the cancer. It will then also help us to come up with the best uh, therapy medication um, for that specific case for that specific patient. Now, let's assume that patient is in the intensive care unit after you know, um, um, uh, a procedure, then within that um, uh, environment we can create truly dense data. So what we're, and, and most of, uh, all of these examples I'm giving you are, are actually products and services we have today. So I'm not talking to you about, you know, something that's years out. It's something that, that we're, we're putting in the market today, we have in the market today, but we're what we increasingly connecting. So talking about dense data, we now can look at a patient and look at, at over 2,000 attributes simultaneously. So that gives us a very precise insight in the condition in uh, potential deterioration and in, in a you know, high fidelity environment in an intensive care unit, that information is really critical because um, um, uh, patients can, can de deteriorate very rapidly. We can also do early warning. So for instance, with a cardio patient, um, we can see true interpretation of the data 
um, looking at multiple aspects, we can see suddenly an increased risk of cardiac arrest, which typically gives us then you know, a window of a couple of hours, sometimes up to six hours, to intervene and actually avoid a cardiac arrest. So that gives us this, this really complex and, uh, and complete synthesized view of a patient that can help us really um, get better control over the health of the patients. Now what we're doing as well is, um, since you, get, you probably have gathered that we, we want to move closer to the patient, we want to help patients, and we want to do it where they are, um, we believe that these new digital solutions will change the way that care is provided. So on the left top side, um, you essentially see um, the tablet-based ultrasound. Now, big deal, you think, but I think it's a really big deal. Actually, it's a service. It's, it's not a device that you buy. You can order it online, but of course only when you're a certified uh, physician. It, it truly makes um, uh, what used to be location-bound, very expensive technology, put it in a place where it's close to, to patients. So if you drop down one picture, you see our health patch. Um, and I think this, this is a very interesting proposition where you have a medical grade patch which measures heartbeat, heart rhythm, breathing, etc that a patient gets when he enters in the hospital is linked back to, you know, our monitoring system so you can keep monitoring the patient if even if they walk around and they go to the you know, to the lounge or the canteen in the hospital. But more interestingly, when the patient gets discharged, they can continue to wear the patch and we can continue to monitor them from home and support them from home. And if we see deterioration, again, we can intervene and, uh, and uh, take care. I already talked about uh, dependent uh, increasingly becoming a digital hub for elderly people, guiding them, augmenting them, and helping them, um, you know, to live at home with dignity, even though they're more and more constrained. So you get a sense of what we're doing to use these digital technologies to, uh, to really support patients where they are. So these patient-centric solutions are, are very much, um, you know, part of our healthcare IoT strategy. So connected devices, connected sensors around you. So with this elderly care proposition, we actually put beacons in the house and the device that they wear shows them how people move around the house. So you can imagine if an elderly person, you know, gets up 20 times a night, you know, that's an issue. But you can also imagine when an elderly person doesn't get up for 20 hours is also an issue. So, so we, we like to see these patterns and these patterns can then, you know, prompt an intervention. So we see these devices around you. Of course, we see them on you. You're wearing them. But, um, you know, we're not, uh, not far off of actually putting connected devices in you. And, and already there is an industry around implantables, you know, both for heart and even for uh, brain stimulation. Um, we will see these devices increasingly getting connected. And, of course, the question you immediately ask is how can we then ensure this is secure? And I think that's the critical question for all of this because we want to ensure that we identify and authenticate those devices, that we have a secure connection with these devices, and that we can understand who is actually using those devices. So how can we make sure that those devices are attached to the person that we have identified as such? So I, I think the, the whole area of device security, device control, device management will play an increasing role. And, you know, what we see as Philips, we're originally, of course, very much a device company. What we see is it's not just sticking a Bluetooth or Zigbee or, or Wi-Fi chip into a device. It's really thinking through how a device is becoming a network, a part of a network and how you truly secure those devices on the, the, the network. So if you start looking at those technologies and capabilities and you want to, you know, almost package them 
in the right way to support um, the, the health of a population, then I think you have to really understand the needs and the cost associated with that uh, population. So what we see is, and, and this is quite similar around the world, so not just in the US, we see it in, in the Netherlands and definitely uh, other Western countries, is that the top 5% of the patients of the, uh, represent about 50% of the overall healthcare cost. Now, who are those patients? They're typically elderly people. Um, they uh, typically have multiple chronic diseases. Many of them have um, have some mental constraints, and many of them, you know, easily panic, or you know, they don't stick to their medication, or you know, they fall. So, so if you look at those needs, then you're looking at programs where you actually want to proactively monitor these patients and make sure that um, that you actually keep them out of the emergency room and keep them out of the hospital by guiding them and supporting them at home. Now below that, there is about you know, 20, 25 percent um, that also represents around 20, 25 percent of the, of the cost. So you almost have a Pareto here where um, you know, 20 percent of the patients in total almost represent 70, 80 percent of the cost. And these deep People are typically, you know, um, people with one, two, or three chronic diseases. They're still, you know, kind of capable of ha handling it, but they have many constraints. Then, of course, below that, we have the people with chronic disease. And, and just in the U.S., there are about 50% of the population has um, a, one or more chronic diseases. Now, many of them will have, you know, early stage. Uh, capable of managing itself. And then, of course, you have 50% of the people that are generally healthy and, um, and clearly um, don't want to move up into that pyramid. Um, so, so when we're looking at these programs, where we're looking at the pump at what we call intensive ambulatory care, where we almost monitor these people as if they were in a general ward. Um, you have acute care where, for instance, somebody who has just underwent surgery and is frail and goes home, we want to proactively monitor these people at home, so acute care programs. Then we have chronic patient management, easier hospital discharge programs, and, and these aging well programs, helping elderly people deal with their constraints. And lastly, of course, specifically for people that have been identified with risk for chronic disease prevention and, and wellness. So now let's look at these programs and how digital technologies play a role in this. So prevention, prevention and wellness is essentially self-management largely, but supported by coaching. And, uh, and, and these are typically people, coaches, that remotely support um, uh, consumers enrolling in these programs, and these programs are typically, you know, identified by consumers themselves or in conjunction with their GP. You know, somebody's overweight, at risk for diabetes, let's enroll them in a weight management program. Um, somebody's at risk for heart failure, we enroll them in a in a cardio program. Um, so these programs generally are a combination of connected devices, so what you see here is our, these are validated medical devices, the health watch, the blood pressure cuff, uh, the weight scale, the um, uh, uh, SpO2 meter, etc. So these devices are connected to an app that guides you to your personal dashboards. It gives you little nudges to stick to your program. But at the same time, you give uh, permission to a coach to support to support you in reaching your goals and helping you, um, you know, as you have more problems sticking to the to the program. So clearly, a combination of of high high tech and high touch, but but largely self management. And and we've seen amazing results already with the first programs that we deployed. Uh, where actually attrition is very low, less than 10 percent, because many of these people, you know, have recognized the need to do this. And these are not fitness or, you know, stay well. These are really around at-risk people. 
Um, we have seen, for, in, for instance, people uh, better controlling their, uh, their hypertension. We've seen uh, pronounced weight loss. So these programs um, are working, and actually consumers like it. Now, for chronic conditions, it's a different story. And, and by the way, the beautiful young woman you see on this picture is my daughter. And uh, she has been co-designing um, our diabetes framework uh, with us. And, and uh, what we've done is we looked at, you know, how can we connect uh, glucose meters, either, you know, Bluetooth-enabled meters or even uh, continuous glucose meters. Um, how can we capture the data, but also how can we combine it with, with a health watch or even, you know, an eye watch or, or, or a Fitbit? Because we want to understand also activities. We want to understand stress because, you know, what you eat, your blood sugars, your activity, stress, um, all of that is relevant to how you manage your insulin. Um, so we also have a program where we help people, um, you know, optimize their, their, their carb intake. We give them um, advice, but, but ultimately what we do is we help them find their sweet spot. You know, find the spot in which they feel comfortable and we help them watch them uh, uh, going out of that zone so that we can then proactively help them. And for that, we actually created two types of, of communities, a private community uh, or a professional community, if you will. In this case, where my daughter can uh, be part of a network that contains, in this case, the in, uh, inter, uh, internist, um, case doc from the Rothbaud Hospital, but also diabetes nurse. There is a nutritionist on the team. There's even a behavioral analyst and a psychologist on the team because many young women, like my daughter, you know, um, they also struggle with the fact that they have to make, you know, almost 200 decisions all related to their condition every day while trying to be a normal person like anybody else. But for instance, if her numbers, you know, her glucose uh, levels are suddenly 150 and she has done everything that she should do, she can then, you know, note to the care team, hey, you know, I'm really high. I think I've done everything I, knew, uh, I need to do. Can you look at my numbers and give me advice? So maybe change the dose of insulin. So we believe that these will be really important. And of course, there are many examples of, of networks that have already shown the importance of this. But we want to make sure also that the information we provide to a type 1 diabetic, the network that's behind her, is validated. And the information you get is not just from typing type 1 diabetes uh, into Google, but really give you know, um, evidence-based information that's helpful for her. Um, we can, of course, say the same about people suffering from COPD, because instead of glucose, we will be managing, uh, measuring SPOT2 and other information. And instead of an insulin pump, you, you'll have a ventilator. And by capturing the information also from that ventilator, we can coach people to better optimize uh, the function of their lungs and, and, and help them guide through uh, their difficulty with breathing and potential deterioration of their condition. Now, if we take it one step further, then we can look at elderly people. And, and actually, many of them w will suffer from uh, type 2 diabetes. So type 1 is, uh, is basically a condition you're born with. with Type 2 is very much also, you can be born with but Most people get diabetes as a result of, uh, of health behaviors. And health behaviors, of course, are increasingly important to health. So health behaviors are, you know, what you eat, how you eat, how much you eat, how you sleep, your stress levels, alcohol and drug intake, um, um, you know, your social environment, the support you get. Um, all of this is, is highly relevant. Um, so as we look at, at elderly people, we see that they get these, these more and more constraints and they actually need to help. And uh, we want to make sure that the help we provide is really tuned to their needs. And, and of course, one of the biggest risks is falling, um, um, but it's not the only risk. We also want to help them make sure they take the medication on time. We want to be there. Um, you know, when we see there's an issue with uh, their blood pressure or their heart. 
And uh, so what we see is that we need to bring these technologies together and make them extremely uh, user friendly because these are elderly people. They're not like my daughter. They wear, they're not born uh, digital. You know, these people have, you know, they, they need to be extremely well guided in the way you, you use that technology. But we've seen tr tremendous results there. We've seen elderly people basically saying, I can't live without this. And, and actually, I don't know if you know Betty White from Golden Girls, but she has become a real spokesperson uh, for Philips because she knows that she cannot live without, uh, without this proposition, without our lifeline proposition. Now, the intensive ambulatory care, um, this is really this top 5%. Um, these are the sickest people that represent the highest cost. And uh, there are many leading uh, integrated delivery networks in the US that have started uh, programs around supporting those people. And um, uh, what we've seen is, is really, really amazing results. Um, so if we look at what we've been do doing with Banner Health, we've seen um, uh, readmissions down almost 45%. We've seen uh, re uh, emergency care da down 65%. We've seen total cost down per patient by 27,000 people, thousand dollars. But more importantly, we've given these p patients back their dignity because they're now at home, they know they're being monitored. If something happens, you know, the care will be organized. They can talk to a doctor through our telehealth capabilities. But most importantly, they have that peace of mind that they're being watched over. And this is also a great combination of very high tech, I would say. It's almost, if you're in a telehealth center, it almost looks like, um, you know, you're watching the, the cockpit of, a, of an airplane. Um, but they combine it with home care so that actually when you need a, a person to be there, they make sure a person is there. You know, people can talk to the patient. But all in all, uh, we've seen tremendous results in a highly scalable model. Because once you set up your, your ambulatory care center, you can monitor thousands and thousands of patients simultaneously. And at any time, only a handful will really need an intervention. Now, I talked about early warning systems uh, earlier. And it's really about very accurate and, and timely detection of a, a patients truly at risk of, of deterioration, of you know, cardiac arrest, um, uh, you know, inflammatory disease. So what, what we've done is we basically said, what we need to do is not just give you the real-time vital signs data. No, we, in, we need to interpret that data. We need to synthesize that data. And we need to bring that together in the context of the patient profile so that we can truly give you an alert when, when things um, are, really, are really looking grim. So uh, if, you, if you walk into an ICU today, you see all these devices beeping. And, and, and basically, what this is is not only making sure that you're just responding to any bleep. It's really making sure you spend your time on the intervention that's most badly needed at the right time. Now, I talked about deep data. And um, you know, we were talking just now about the general ward and the ICU. But um, many patients come into the hospital to do a diagnosis. And, the diagnosis can be because we've seen early indications, for instance, of cancer. And uh, what we then need to do is make sure that we can um, diagnose what and where that cancer is. What we see, of course, we've done this for years through our, our imaging systems. But what we see right now is that the information coming out from our devices is increasingly the start of a deep diagnosis and a personalized treatment. So we're looking for solutions where 
we can create universal data management where we see the, the data is not just coming from the, the image and the, the, the radiologist observations. The data is also coming maybe for even from the wearables, from the medical records, and we have the, the lab test, and we have to bring that all together. We need to be able to collaborate because we need to do shared decision making, especially on co complex patients. And sometimes it has to be cross-enterprise because you may deal with a complex cancer case and maybe it's um, the doctor at MD Anderson in Houston that has most experience and you want to collaborate with that doctor at this time for this patient. So you want to make it location independent. Then, of course, you want to make sure that all the information is there that's relevant for the case of that patient. Now, we call that the mission briefing. And in the mission briefing, we want to make sure everything is there. There is a timeline with, uh, with the relevant history, medical history of the patient. There is electronic medical records data. There are interpreted blood tests. But there can even be the results of um, a pathology interpretation, an image interpretation. And then more importantly, that will launch us into a, a further deep dive. So let's say we have recognized that this patient um, has liver cancer. We can then actually open up the images. We can look at prior images and synchronize them. And we can automatically calculate the volume of a cancer. We can create a 3D model. But more importantly, we can start interpreting uh, that cancer. We can give the tools for the radiologist and the oncologist to really go deep and make the right diagnosis and, most importantly, come up with a therapy, a treatment plan that's 100% tuned to the specific needs of a specific patient. Now, we strongly believe that this can only happen if this data comes together. If this data comes together, not just you know, from the wearables, from the apps, from the observations, but also the medical devices, the medical records, you know, even the information from the payers who have a lot of people's histories, from the healthcare organizations and uh, professionals. And we bring that information together in a way that it's truly interoperable, in a way that it can be aggregated and analyzed, and ultimately it has to become actionable and it has to improve the outcomes for those patients. So we have to bring together the data you know, from the professional uh, and the personal worlds and put that together in such a way um, that we can create these new um, systems and applications around it. So what we've done is for the last couple of years, we've been working hard on providing that open um, cloud-based environment, um, actually natively uh, born for standards, so uh, we have taken the, the FHIR interface, the REST interface, as our core interface. Um, we have built in the capabilities to link to virtually any EMR, the capability to pull in um, PEX data, image data, to pull in information from digital pathology, but also from wearables. Um, and we want to make sure that uh, this is not just Philips devices. Uh, we want this truly to be an open environment where actually everybody who contributes their data to this will have their data encrypted and continue to own, where ultimately everybody who's interested in providing innovation for health can start building their own proposition. So uh, we have a set of core functions um, you know, for the IT folks um, in the audience, um, you'll recognize a lot of this. But I, I want to run through it quickly, because I, I think it gives you a sense of, of how we, we're making this into a core, I would say, health data and device utility. Um, so first and foremost, we're talking about authorized. So it, it's really about securely identifying, authenticating people, you know, um, patients, physicians but also devices. Then making sure that 
uh, that the data generated by those uh, participants or users um, is encrypted end-to-end -end and that we have and allow for the permissions so that you know a patient can give permission to his general practitioner to share his personal data but you know a specialist can give permission to share that data also with the GP the other care team and even with the patient so managing securely exchanging data making sure that we connect these devices at and apps but also um, the connectivity is a little bit more than that it's also making sure it's truly interoperable so that we have the same interpretation of the data and we all know that that data is no longer all neatly structured and, um, and, and relational databases that data is increasingly you know observations in natural language um, it can be streams of data over time um, so we're, we're looking at data from different formats, different sources that we need to structure through um, uh, natural language processing, machine uh, machine learning. Store, you know, clearly we want people to keep uh, um, a trail of their uh, their history um, to store their uh, their data in a secure way, encrypted way. But also, we should allow anybody who builds their, uh, their application on this utility to host those applications. Analyze is obviously a critical part. You know, the ease of aggregating data, um, analyzing data, and as I said, this data is not just structured data. There will be unstructured data. There will be large data because a complex um, oncology case may go up to you know a terabyte and if you want to aggregate terabytes and terabytes you, you better have a, a pretty robust infrastructure uh, and tools to do that and ultimately to share back that information through a standard based environment and then lastly the ability to orchestrate the data to create the pathways um, for patients that are not only the pathways in the hospital, but pathways outside the hospital in their everyday life. And that may plug back into an EPIC or Cerner EMR once they get to the hospital. So these are the core services that we expose through APIs and that will allow people to connect devices, to connect applications, but more importantly also to create uh, innovative new functionality. So, Creating the technology platform is one thing. We also believe we need to create the co-create platform. So we believe that we're all looking at very complex um, challenges where you know, we want the healthcare system to, to change, to become more patient-centric, more outcome-based, where teams work together and patients have 24-7 access to the right care. Well, that require quite a bit of change, people change, culture change, process change, reimbursement change, and yes, technology change. So so what, what we believe is that we need to promote different players in the industry to come together and we want to facilitate that. We want to facilitate innovative new companies, we want to facilitate our customers, the healthcare providers, we want to facilitate payers, uh, pharma companies. Um, and governments to come together and work with us on these challenges. And we bring not only the digital capabilities, our device capabilities, but also our tremendous design capabilities, and uh, our research capabilities, so that together we can um, address these challenges and move towards where we all believe healthcare should be transforming. So I, I think we're living in, in, in really exciting times when it comes to healthcare. You know, I spent most of my life in uh, in information technology, most of that in the financial services. I really believe that the opportunity we have um, with the opportunity we have with uh, uh, with the healthcare system is tremendous. But of course, we also have uh, quite a number of challenges that we need to overcome. So we need to collectively look at how can we actually change the business model. You know, uh, that can be radical, like what we've seen in um, in the transportation and accommodation industries with uh, with Uber 
or Airbnb the most uh, most in quoted. Uh, uh, but I think there's a lot of change w within as well, and and I think we see a lot of leading players, you know, innovating their business models. Um, of course, we need that secure data interoperability with which you already indicate you consider to be critical for the success. And it needs to be open. It, ne it truly needs to be open, and it needs to be as secure as it's open. Now, we need to integrate this new technology in existing infrastructures. And we all know there's a lot of legacy out there. And we also know that that may expose us in, in building truly good end-to-end -end secure solutions. And then lastly, you know, not only the business model innovation, because designing a new business model is way easier than deploying a new model. So that adoption of model, uh, you know, guiding people through it and, and truly proving that we're making impact, you know, proving that the, the outcomes are getting better and we provide the, the scientific evidence for that. So these are the challenges. None of them, I think, are blocking us from getting there. Some of them may slow us down, but I clearly see us being on a path to um, a brave new healthcare world. So with that, I, I would ask you, would like to, um, uh, you Jeroen? know, part with some key takeaways. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought we were ready for questions. Okay, we do have no, a few. No, I, but I, I just want to want to wrap up one minute, and then by all means, let's let's go back to questions. So we, we, we really want to see the acceleration of these new models, and I think we have to do it collectively. And as I said, many players, established players, are going there. You know, I think Kaiser has always been a good example, but Banner, Mercy, um, Intermountain, there are many players that, that are moving that way. Uh, we believe that digital technologies and models are key enabled for key enablers for this quality cost and performance jump. These network ma care models will clearly put the patients at the center. And ultimately, it's data analytics that will allow us to do this at scale. But there's no way any one of us can do it alone. So let's jointly innovate the health system. Thank you. So I think we're, very much. we're ready to, uh, to interact. Oh, very good. Yes, we are running late, and I, I know people need to leave, so I will try to get to as many questions as possible. Deborah Medeiros is asking, is, Hil is Philips looking at working with alternative types of care organizations like skilled nursing facilities, assisted living memory care centers? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, these are, of course, new areas for us. But for instance, uh, 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 through our Lifeline product, we're getting into elderly care. Uh, we're increasingly looking at how we can support not just the traditional hospital, but the network. And the network you know, has these facilities. And I think by truly networking these facilities with the hospitals, with the patients at home, we can make um, a, a major step. And, and Philips is absolutely looking to support these kind of facilities. Uh, David Eilers is asking, how do you rationalize improved technology tools merging with more payment for value scenarios? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I, I, I think it's very hard to do payment for value if you cannot measure value. So, and, and if you cannot baseline the current cost. So, so that's what a lot of these um, population health um, propositions are about. So if you have a population of patients, can we first dissect those populations and see what the, the current needs and uh, um, uh, costs are, but also what are the current, current outcomes? So for instance, I gave you that example in Banner. Because we measured uh, the cost and, 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 and state uh, of these patients, and as we did the program and could evaluate the program, we could see that actually the cost was reducing um, through less readmissions and through less um, emergency care, which are the highest you know, impact drivers. But we could also see that uh, the people enrolled in the program were were much more healthy. 
and we could see that through many indicators, not just their uh, physiological state, which we can measure, of course, through weight, heartbeat, etc., but also their mental state. And, and I think that's the big opportunity we have, because if we connect things, um, if we can have the data operate, we can also measure, and we can improve, and we can measure outcomes, and we can drive reimbursements towards those outcomes. And, uh, you know, of course, we'll, we'll have an interim period. We already see it. So, for instance, you have the 30-day readmission. So if somebody has, done, uh, uh, has undergone a procedure in a hospital, and within 30 days uh, uh, there's any complications associated with that procedure, and you have to go back to the hospital, it's not being reimbursed. So it basically goes to the bottom line of the hospital. Now we can start tracking that. We can monitor these people at home, and we can make sure we can intervene before something deteriorates. And at the same time, you know, therefore get better outcomes for the patient, but also lower costs for the provider. So these are already the, the, the indicators towards, you know, better control of outcomes and also reimbursing against it. Mm -hmm. Um, George Scarlatis has asked, uh, would you please define or differentiate between deep and dense data? Okay. Yeah, well, th that's a good one. Um, the deep data is really where we say we go deep into the body. You know, uh, with, 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 with imaging, we already go pretty deep in, in, into the, 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 the body, but we can now go to cell level. We can look at the structure of a cell, the protein. We can even look at what wires a cell. So the DNA structure of a cell. So that's what we mean with deep. We're, we're really, really going as deep as probably you can get into understanding. Um, you know, we all know that the DNA drives how cells uh, multiply, and and of course, uh, cancer is uh, a deficiency of 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 of, of uh, the functioning of the cells. So what we're saying is we we have to go that deep to understand. Um, you know, uh, disease like cancer. And the dense data is where we look at multiple facets. So, for instance, with dense data, we mean we, we look at all the vital sign breathing, ha um, heartbeat, heart rate, um, but also um, other attributes, um, uh, blood pressure, and, and, and more and more data. The more data we collect, the denser the picture becomes, the, the, the more granular the picture becomes of the, of the patient. So if you, if you almost would, would take a picture today of what we know about a patient, it, it's, I would say, highly, you know, a, a very rough grain. So what we want to make, we want to make it as fine-grained as possible. And in order to do that, you, you have to den make the data more dense. It's almost like putting more pixels on the screen. Well, thank you. Uh, we are out of time, and uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to thank you, Arun Tas, uh, CEO of Philips uh, Connected Health, Connected Care and Health Informatics at Philips, to for the very informative presentation. And before you leave, uh, let the audience know that there will be an exit survey that will pop up on the screen as you leave. We do ask you complete it. Uh, we do evaluate uh, your responses in an effort to keep this program valuable. And you will receive in coming days an email with a link to a replay of the webinar. Uh, you are free to share it with anyone who you feel would be interested and use it and view it again. So thanks, everyone. Thank you to Jeroen Tas and the audience. I appreciate your time and have a wonderful day. Thank you. My pleasure.